Welcome to this training on defining privacy. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. In this training, we are going to be talking about defining privacy. This section will explore the meaning of privacy and why privacy is important. So what is privacy? Sometimes people say they don't need privacy because they have nothing to hide. However, that's not what privacy is necessarily about. Every day, we do things in our homes, in our offices, in our schools that we might not do in a park or on the sidewalk or in public generally, not because we have something to hide, there are parts of our lives that we'd rather keep private. We have laws that require that our doctors and lawyers and teachers keep information confidential, so we feel free to reveal sensitive information. Again, not necessarily something we want to hide, but maybe something that would make others treat us differently. And even if you do have something to hide, that doesn't mean you're doing something bad and don't deserve privacy. You may not want your friend to know how much you dislike their new haircut or may want more choice over what you do or do not share with the people in your life. But this is already a little confusing. Privacy isn't just for people with something to hide. So what is it? That's not an easy question to answer. Privacy changes depending on context. Think about it. What you want your doctor to know may be different than what you want your child to know or what you want your boss to know. Information isn't private or not private. The situation and the people who you are sharing the information with matters. Just to make things even more complicated, privacy also means different things to different people. Carnegie Mellon University's Privacy Illustrated Project asked people, including kids, to draw what privacy meant to them. Some of the answers reflect the many ways privacy might be defined. For example, it can mean being alone and creating private spaces, such as in your bedroom, under a blanket, sleeping away from your kids, keeping your siblings out, emailing and texting alone or being able to be intimate with someone. This picture from a five-year-old shows her hiding under the covers of her bedroom when she was asked to draw what privacy meant to her. Privacy can also mean privacy from physical exposure, such as being left alone while changing clothes in the bathroom or when bathing. This picture by Lucinda, age eight, shows her sister knocking on the door when she's changing. Privacy can also mean physical separation, such as having personal space or your personal bubble around you, or being separated from others by doors, fences, and walls. This picture from Eli, age seven, shows someone leaving him alone in the bathroom. Privacy can also mean privacy of thoughts and ideas, both protecting your internal thoughts, as well as preventing others from using your thoughts by something like cheating. In this picture from Elizabeth, age 11, she showed her thinking that this other person she's talking to is a brat. And the other person can read her thoughts and now knows that she was called a brat in the thoughts of the other person. Elizabeth apparently was very concerned about this and said that if people could read your thoughts, it would be creepy. Privacy can also mean surveillance. It can mean being watched or monitored, most often portrayed by some sort of big brother, uh, government entities, or companies that are watching you, as in this picture by Tenna, a postdoc student, age 34. It can also mean online privacy, which is what we will mostly discuss throughout these trainings. So this can mean everything from computer security to passwords protecting your information, locks, webcams, or even concerns about spam or privacy on social media. 
In this picture by Maya, age 11, it shows closed doors, locks, safes, passwords, keep out signs, email, Google potentially tablets with an arrow pointing to a webcam and cameras in the corner. So with all these definitions of privacy, you've had a few scholars try and figure out how to categorize them. Daniel Solove from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. has the most frequently cited taxonomy of information privacy, taking all the different definitions proposed and pulling them into a list. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I suggest you read through them in the attached slides or information because all of these different definitions of privacy may affect the privacy your students want, the privacy that you want as an educator, the privacy that parents want for their children, and the types of privacy risks and the ways to mitigate those risks that we'll be discussing throughout all of the trainings. So some of these other definitions, people watching you, being interrogated or questioned to get information, information being combined about you, and you don't necessarily know all of that information and what that might tell people about you, linking information back to a particular individual, insecurity such as carelessness and protecting stored information, information being used for another purpose other than the one for which it was collected, information being used to blackmail or information that could make someone be made fun of, information that's distributed that's false or misleading about you, and invasive information that disturbs your home or what you're doing in private, or information that tries to change your decisions regarding any of your private affairs. As discussed, privacy means different things to different people. And what privacy means, or what the word stands for when someone says, you violated my privacy, evolves over time. For example, the first major legal article in the United States on privacy was written because of the newfangled technology of the portable camera, which was being used by paparazzi to take pictures of rich people leaving dinner parties. Today, concerns about privacy are often linked to concerns about whether something is fair. In this quote, privacy was once misconstrued about being about hiding and secrecy. Now it's understood to be something much more pressing, power dynamics between the individual, the state, and the market or companies. Data protection must seek to mitigate the inherent power imbalances. So it is very important that when someone brings up privacy, you consider what it may mean to them, ask them, and learn more about their concerns because what they may mean may be very different than what you may think. Now that we've briefly defined privacy, why is it important? We're gonna spend many of these other trainings talking about privacy risks, but here's some top line information. Just like toothpaste in its bottle, once information leaves, it can be very hard to get it back where it belongs. There can be short or long-term harms when it data is collected, used, or shared. And it's really important to know that privacy should not be a barrier to helping students. Instead, it can protect students. It can protect their futures. It can protect them from bullying or misuse of data. It can also give them agency over both their own information as well as their education more broadly. Now we come to our first activity. Go to these Google Slides to complete this activity that helps you think about how you'd like your data to be collected or shared. Uncomfortable using Google Slides? That's fine. On the web page where you accessed this activity, or in the comments if you're on YouTube, there is a link to an offline version of this activity. You can now pause the video, 
while you complete the activity or keep going to do the activity after the training. Welcome back. I hope that activity was useful for all of you in thinking about how you want your data to be used. So let's talk about some core principles of privacy. Some of the key things that are required when people want privacy are described on this page. These are long-standing principles that have been around since the 1970s and are the basis for most laws around the world when it comes to privacy. People want notice. What information about them is being created and how will it be used? People want choice. Whether to opt in or opt out as to whether and how their information will be used or disclosed. People want to be able to consent or not and when they don't consent, they want to make sure that information about them cannot be collected or created or used or shared or that they have some control about how it will be used or how it will be shared. People want their information to be secure. They don't want it to be breached. They don't want it to be misused or lost. They want to make sure that the information is reliable, accurate, complete, and current, especially important in the school context where a mistake in a transcript could affect a student's whole life. They want to make sure that they have access to information about them, that they can access, check, and verify information about themselves or their children. And they want to make sure that whoever has the data, whoever is using the data, collecting it, sharing it, they want to make sure that that entity or that person is held accountable for ensuring all of these other principles and that there's some sort of penalty if any of these rights are potentially violated. It is worth noting though that for most students, notice, choice, consent, and access are rarely rights they have for themselves. Parents are generally the ones given these rights until students turn 18. Some of these rights are often shifted a bit in the school context as well. Parents don't get to individually approve each and every worksheet that's given in the classroom or every page of a textbook. And similarly, by being in a public classroom in a public school, there are certain times when information is shared about students in order to keep the school running or to move the class forward or certain assignments that are done using, using education technology where some of these principles will not apply. We'll talk about some of that in later trainings. So for the purpose of these trainings, we're going to be broadly focusing on student data collection, use, and sharing, whether collected in person or through technology. We won't be talking about child or youth data in the non-student context. Children's privacy more generally is a little bit out of our scope. Our focus will also be limited to the school context, data collected for or through a school, whether a K-12 or higher education institution. And these trainings will primarily focus on educators who serve K-12 students, but many of the discussed issues are also applicable to higher education. As mentioned earlier, Privacy Illustrated is a great resource to check out even more. This is one of my favorite slides. It shows a picture of two people playing chess from a first grader who says that privacy is about people coming in while you're playing chess and being able to tell them to go away because chess is a private game. There are many more excellent pictures <laughs> describing what privacy means to all sorts of people on Carnegie Mellon University's Privacy Illustrated website. Check it out and perhaps consider drawing your own picture to show what privacy means to you or as an assignment for your students if they'd like to expand the collection.
We have now come to the end of this training module. This is an optional reflection. Take a moment to Google yourself. Did you find anything surprising? Would your students find anything surprising if they Googled themselves? How do you talk to your students about privacy? Thank you so much for joining us for this training. Feel free to go on to the next training or take a break.